Good morning, everyone. It's straight up 10 o'clock. Uh, we want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day to attend this webinar. Today, we'll be talking about the ecosystem of mobile forensics and how to use connected and integrated systems to scale up and improve your investigations. I want to thank Frank, uh, Forensic Focus for hosting today's webinar and thank all of you for attending. What we're talking about today, uh, this is the web, uh, webinar description that was posted online. Um, it, as we know, mobile devices are a gold mine of data and it continues to grow exponentially. Uh, it's a great opportunity to kind of talk about uh, the ways to integrate different systems and, and increase efficiency with the ever growing pile of, of um, information and exams that are, are, are coming in to most agencies. We'll talk about efficiencies. Uh, we'll do an exploration of how MSAB's ecosystem can dramatically scale up um, your abilities um, to, to deal with that influx. So we'll look at ways examiners, investigators, and analysts can harness the power of MSAB's mobile forensic tools and to reduce the backlog. And we're gonna use some more advanced tools and higher level tools to kind of combine our efforts. And we'll get uh, into more of that in a moment. Here's our basic agenda today. We'll do some introductions. We'll briefly discuss the mobile device explosion that many of us are experiencing. We'll talk about what's needed for some changes, some problem solving, and a new approach to forensics. We'll overview software. We'll talk about our platforms and hardware uh, that we'd add to a network. We'll talk about a beginner's guide to an ecosystem approach, and that'll be a little bit more practical and visual um, after we go through some, some um, information throughout this webinar. And uh, last but not least, it'll be followed up with some discussion and Q&A. I have uh, one of our support staff, uh, support extraordinaire Duncan Marchbank um, from our UK team. Uh, we'll be on the line as well for some, some discussion and Q&A at the end of the webinar as well. So let's begin with some introductions about MSAB and your presenter today. So MSAB's mission is to keep driving the mobile forensics industry. We're delivering the most capable solutions. We are a vendor. However, we're also a partner that's dedicated to your agency's success. And what's great is we're a partner with real-time customer support, a dedicate, that dedicated customer success team, and a research and development team dedicated to staying ahead in the pursuit of data from all types of these mobile devices. Again, we've been around since 1984. And with that, we have 100% focus on mobile forensics only. So worldwide, we've shipped 21,000 kits to date. We have customers in over 120 countries. Our products are used by 100% of the UK police. We have offices in 16 countries and over 200 employees at this point. And we work with the forensics community. Society has entrusted these agencies and organizations to deal with individuals and groups that create crime and disorder. Together, we develop new solutions um, for, for using mobile forensics in a responsible way and to hopefully address the obstacles in your way to uh, gather important intel and, and evidence. With an extraction platform that supports, you see here over 32,000 devices, and this number changes weekly. Uh, kudos to our research and development team. Um, using XRY gets you well underway to tackling that monumental task associated with extraction and examination of evidence from mobile devices. So who am I? Uh, my name is Greg Masterson. I work as a sales engineer for MSAB. I work in a support role in my normal day-to-day -day prior to COVID was meeting with law enforcement agencies through Canada and the US, uh, preferably in person, to talk about challenges that they're facing in the mobile forensics field. Frustration with tools, overwhelming workloads, concerns about proper training, uh, dated procedures, they're all aspects of law enforcement challenges in mobile forensics that I'm personally familiar with and that I kind of interact with most of these agencies and hear about all the time. So my role here is to provide what support and information that I can to make your job easier and I hope more efficient. And we'll talk about that today. My background, 10 years as a local cop in patrol and detective work, uh, worked an original countywide high-tech crime task, uh, high-tech crime task force back in 02. Uh, that was primarily computer and uh, PC based, some servers uh, using uh, NCASE, FTK, and some other uh, computer forensics platforms. Uh, we also worked online undercover cases because there was a booming um, need for that at the time. 
Uh, 2003, I was hired by the agency that I was on loan to and assigned to the high tech unit and assigned to electronic surveillance unit responsibilities as well. I was later promoted and combined the high tech unit and the electronic surveillance unit and in 2018 created the, our first cybercrime task force. Uh, a fancy way of, of saying that we were training local PDs in the best way to collect mobile devices and, and ultimately trying to train them in uh, examination procedures to stem the flow and influx of requests into our unit. I retired from Union County Prosecutor's Office in New Jersey in 2018 after 25 years of service. So in order to talk about the challenges many of you face, we need to talk about the issue common to most of you, and that's the explosion in mobile device usage and resulting evidence. So whether it's the increasing size of the devices, um, the increased security or the complexity of app data, uh, kind of universal issues across uh, the mobile forensics field, our identification of the obstacles and our response so far is really important. So let's just go back a few years. This is a small scale example, but one, uh, but, but it's an example that many of you may be able to identify with. So these are statistics I used to request the hiring of more staff and to justify more training and equipment for my, my unit in 2017. Relatively small unit, large size county with a large population. The unit had experienced year over year increases in the mobile forensics requests at a time when one of the largest kind of historical contributing factors, um, homicide cases were actually in decline. So clearly something else was happening here because the workload was increasing why our, our customary workload um, that we were used to seeing was actually going down. Those type of cases were going down. So we quickly realized that several factors were affecting the growth all at the same time. Knowing the statistics and the real numbers was just the start. We tried to determine the why so we could formulate a logical plan for dealing with the increase, um, ultimately to avoid uh, backlogs. So what we found was a sharp, the sharp increases weren't a why question, they were a who question. So where formerly most requests came from internal units from with our, within the agency, from our staff that had been briefed in the value of data, found on mobile devices, how to collect them, that type of thing, the local police departments were also seeing the value for gathering the evidence for lesser crimes. So call activity, location data, digital images, all hugely valuable pieces that could prove a wide range of cases. Uh, and as we educated these officers in proper collection uh, for mobiles, the demand for examination spiked. So several contributing factors. And, and for it, it, the type of cases was across the board. So added to the in, increase in officers familiar with the benefits of forensically acquired phone data was that more people are just getting phones. And we've seen that year over year increase. Young adults and seniors are now the fastest growing group of people who decided that a mobile phone was a must have item. Uh, I know I've purchased a few for Christmas gifts over the last couple of years for my kids. So you can see here the percent of population who owns a cell phone by region. And North America obviously has more accounts than people, um, like several other countries in the world right now. So that's a lot of phones. So over 2,700 law enforcement personnel completed a survey with the majority of the respondents coming from investigators and forensic examiners. And the results are, are, are pretty widespread and known at this point that Minimally, 85% of criminal investigations now include some sort of digital data, and smart smartphones remain the primary source for digital evidence for over 90% of law enforcement in the U.S. So there's a quote from Alison Saunders, head of the Crown Prosecution Service in the U.K. Take one recent, uh, the criminal justice system is creaking and unable to cope with the huge amounts of data being generated by technology. Take one recent rape case where they met on Tinder. It took 600 police hours to go through the digital material. You can have a judge say, I want a download of that iPad, and it'll take 15 officers working all weekend to get it if that's what he deems necessary. And according to the New York City DA, Cyrus Vance, the single most important criminal justice challenge in the last 10 years is, in my opinion, the expanded use of mobile devices by bad actors to plan, execute, and communicate about crimes. So every device is unique and needs to be individually reverse engineered. There's a lot of them out there. There's huge variations even amongst the same models. So MSAB has identified 37 different variants of the Samsung Galaxy S8 alone. That's 37 different model numbers that came out with just one release. And every time an app is updated, it has the potential to change how and where the data is stored on a handset and whether or not that data is encrypted or going to be accessible. 
not to mention the turnaround time to kind of retool to make sure we get all that data. And the world's storing more data than ever before, and that means extraction times inevitably increase. In the future, the linear extraction of one device at a time won't be possible. Users will have to simultaneously extract data or just fall behind, and the sheer size and length of time to do those extractions is why. And uh, last year, Samsung delivered on a promise, a one terabyte storage promise uh, for uh, flash storage. So things are getting larger uh, by the month and by the year. So is it too much information? So not only are the number of devices coming in and the size of the devices increasing, your resulting data, of course, is getting larger. Um, in the picture, a 3.46 gigabyte XRY file from a 256 gig phone pretty efficient in, in grabbing that data and making it a little smaller, but there's 1.4 million pictures on that device and you could see 2.39 million chat messages. So this we know is what forensic examiners are dealing with and it's, it's what investigators and intelligence analysts are also dealing with, the huge amount of data and, and how to parse through it. So the backlog is the enemy and does everyone in your agency uh, agree? Most people don't really think about the backlog until they're told it's gonna take a few weeks to get their, their device back. Uh, it slows down investigations and prosecution. It frustrates stakeholders and in indicates that maybe we need more efficiency in the ways and procedures and, and, and the way we handle it. So let's talk about making changes and MSAB's approach to this issue, which we refer to as an ecosystem. So mobile forensics works wonders to fight crime, as we know, but it's the challenges. Time's tight. Efficiency, which is what we'll talk a lot about today, is key. Budgets are strained. Investments must be justified. Uh, those, those memos to justify equipment and training are getting longer and longer. Legislation, technology, and crime keep evolving. So it's, it's critical to stay ahead. So what will you do? We are all acutely aware of increasing need for mobile device extractions. Is more staffing coming your way? Is that something that just kind of happens? Um, has your budget been expanded tremendously over the last couple of years? Um, are you able to easily justify what you need by showing the amount of work being accomplished and the efficiencies you have built in? And the ecosystem approach enables users to do more with some integrated tools and again, those efficiencies. So one tool can't do everything and no one can have every tool. And with shrinking budgets, you need to be crystal clear in describing what you need and why you need it. So we'll talk about how these tools operate together and provide functions that increase efficiency. Um, efficiency is great. It's great for doing more, and it's also great for showing others that you're you're building those efficiencies in. So the purchase of additional equipment is justified because you've already done that. It's not being spent willy nilly. There, there's not there's not uh, any reason to think that that you're you're not focusing your efforts, and 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 that's what we'll talk about as well. But how does that work? How does an ecosystem work exactly? So. Let's first look at the software in the ecosystem. I'll assume most of you are familiar with XRY and Examine and a brief overview of some of the new features is all we need to move on kind of to the next portion of this presentation, which is, uh, is focused on that connectivity. So XRY uh, is our core extraction software tool. Uh, today, it covers a wide range of mobile, wearable, portable, and connected devices. And as the mobile market uh, expands and changes, uh, so do we. Interoperability with other platforms is also crucial, uh, both in the data that we can ingest into our programs and analyze, as well as the methods of submitting the data downstream for further analysis. So you see here that we work with several industry-leading technologies that you may already be uh, uh, may already be using. Excuse me. So we are continuously optimizing our interface according to user feedback. So XRY is now better than ever by specializing on data extraction and with plug and play functionality up front, as well as more complex abilities for specialized cases and more advanced users, we cover more devices than ever. So again, we keep it simple up front, simplistic screens, plug in the phone, click here, kind of move forward. Um, but there's plenty of power under the hood uh, that can be accessed pretty quickly if you have a more advanced uh, need. If we're discussing efficiency, you should know that every XRY office license allows three simultaneous extractions with just one single license key, making you three times more effective. Um, I can't tell you how many times that I've talked to existing customers um, that are aware of a lot of the great features in XRY, but are not utilizing this feature. And once it's discussed, uh, begin to. So three at a time, 
get those extractions out of the way and move on to the next. Again, just a couple more features here on XRY. Another considerable addition of late to XRY's capabilities is category and time span. It's a pretty big leap forward at the point of extraction. This isn't narrowing your focus after the fact. The ability to narrow the scope of the extraction by both time frame and artifact category. So for data privacy and shaving off the time it takes to complete an extraction, uh, there are huge benefits to examiners using this built-in feature. And again, in, in the past, we've always used the get everything and narrow it to what we need later approach. This changes that ability pretty substantially. And uh, just, just two more features here. Recently, WhatsApp, Signal, and Telegram data has become increasingly difficult to acquire as uh, security protocols and encryption have improved for mobile devices and more specifically these, these apps. So lately examiners have been forced to use time consuming manual processes, the, the uh, photography from above with the glare in the background type procedure. Um, XRY Photon is a really unique feature within XRY that lets examiners recover and analyze end-to-end -end encrypted app conversations from Android phones. And, and basically how it works is that we are uh, taking screenshots within Android of the actual particular apps, and you can see it operating here. Um, it's hands-free. Um, it's an automated version of manual app examination, but it stores the data, stores the photos, and scrapes those photos for the actual text. And that makes it searchable. So you can watch the phone as we collect the data and decode the text to make it searchable while you do something else. Um, you can see the screen kind of moving and changing here. That's all within Photon. You're not touching the screen or doing that. Real useful, real useful tool and feature. And last but not least um, that I want you aware of within XRY that may help is an optimized version of image recognition. Um, this makes the use of a graphics processing unit um, to accelerate image classification very fast. Um, so image classification, what does that mean? It's, it's basically a photo DNA type procedure. Um, the result is images that are classified into 12 categories automatically, um, and they're available to you as you view them and examine to narrow the time it takes you to get through the images. Really great use of GPU technology that's, that's in the marketplace and getting cheaper, cheaper every day to assist examiners in getting the work done faster and more efficiently. So that's XRY, our extraction tool. And our family of analysis solutions is called Examine. Originally, the key challenge was access to the data, but as many of you know, a lot of the work is now making sense of all the data you recovered because there's just so much of it. So you can see here one of our ways to investigate information and artifacts visually, a way to see things in our Examine Connections tab to see where there may be commonality of associates uh, or where uh, mapping comes into play to determine um, where your suspect has been. And uh, here's that connections tab to show those uh, those common associates. Really valuable way to review exam data. And the ability to include call, de call detail rate records from cellular providers and import warrant returns is, is something that's uh, underutilized. The warrant returns is pretty new. If you're search serving search warrants on the major providers, Instagram and that type of thing, and you get those search warrants back, um, they're pretty uh, unreadable. And, and we're now providing ways to import those uh, warrant returns into Examine so you can review them alongside the rest of your evidence. Uh, call Detail rec Records has been around for a while. Um, you import the records that you're provided. And if you have four of the phones in a case, but that fifth suspect got away with his phone, pull his Call Detail Records, ingest them, and you could do cross analysis amongst all those exhibits. Very useful way to do things. Examine exports give users the ability to export either all the recovered data or the narrowed scope of tag data as you move through your examination. Um, you can move it to other analytical platforms, including Nuix and Penlink. Um, we're gonna discuss this more um, in, in the next section, but you can see here we have buttons to, to push out Nuix data and extended XML data for ingestion into those, those platforms. And then, we're on to exec. Um, if you're familiar with XRY and examine, you may not be as familiar with exec. Um, so exec is the heart of the ecosystem approach. It's called exec director. And it's basically enterprise level management for the forensic ecosystem. 
So this approach allows for a central server to monitor the, for the forensic system you have in place. And we'll talk about how and what those benefits are, but it allows you to monitor usage, success, software versions, and to manage users in a few unique ways. And, and we'll show a little bit of that. So here you can see the exec console, which is kind of a one-stop shop screen that allows you to visually monitor the current usage and the health of the systems that are connected into your ecosystem. So this example shows the number of total systems currently online, the different regions, um, a trend over time uh, of, of how many are being accomplished, examine devices per user, and, and there's a lot of usability there and customization you can do to review the type of information that you need to see. So the suite of management screens in Exec Director is easy to use and understand. One of the more useful components is the live monitoring connection feature. So you can see who's online, what systems are online, the status of those systems, um, and what software version is even running on those connected systems. And knowing is one thing, but being able to do something about and interact is another. Um, exec doesn't just monitor, it provides the ability to remotely update your devices to the latest software version. So in meetings, I talk a lot about how often forensics is changing, new exploits, new passcode bypasses, new support for device models. And the single most important thing you can do with your forensic tool is keep it up to date. Um, often a problem as you get busier or different people get busy and don't update. So with exec, one of the, the outstanding features of exec is that when these uh, outlying systems are connected to it, uh, you can easily update your software remotely and from one screen. You can see here it's, you know, re re update your software, renew your license, all from a central hub. Um, really a, a, a big management tool and, and makes things a lot easier as far as monitoring and updating. And starting with software version 9.2 running on kiosks and tablets, exec can also report on how much space is left uh, for examination files and storage on the end user devices. So there's that, that communication both ways to report information back to you, um, and let you know maybe where you need to intervene as a as a manager. You can see here a couple that are updated to 9.2, and we can see the size that's left uh, on the local hard drives. So like I said, Exec is a server-based program that will monitor your network for forensic systems and allow some of the options we just talked about um, and storage for your evidence X or Y files. Here's an example of a simple setup running on an existing network and more on this in a few minutes with our own example that we'll actually build out together. And using our tool called Exec Export, one of my favorite tools, uh, you could automatically set up batch exports of your evidence files. So as you're using X or Y, maybe you're reviewing using Examine, um, and those X or Y files are, are sitting locally on the machine. Um, in larger scale environments, you may want those backed up to a local server. Um, and I mentioned it earlier, you may want to convert those X or Y files to say extended XML. So exec export will monitor the folders where you store your X or Y files and complete these functions automatically on a timed basis or when something's dropped into the folder, it'll, it'll see it and, and do what it needs to do to get those files either converted or moved to where it needs to go. So why would you need to convert all your evidence files to extended XML or, or um, XML? Again, the goal is to collate examinations files and export them uh, upstream um, for those, those larger tools that you may be using already. And, and that's why exec export's very helpful for you. So last review of the software, software items that we've talked about in one very fancy slide. X or Y for extractions, examine for review, and exec is that, that central hub and that central monitoring, monitoring feature. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So we have done a very quick overview of software. Now let's talk a quick overview of hardware for building out our ecosystem. And afterwards, again, we'll talk about uh, an actual implementation and some of the benefits that we'll do together. So exec sits on the network. These devices are connected. This connectivity allows for communication. It's a general slide and let's get more specific about hardware. So the office kit is responsible for, I think it's about 75% of our our users and product sales. It's the most popular and flexible platform and the choice uh, for most lab-based examiners. Uh, it runs on a PC or laptop of your choice and comes with plenty of add-ons. 
Um, I'm showing this slide really to take note of that puck in the lower left. Uh, that's a device that will make it a little easier for you to take advantage of XRY's ability to conduct three exams at a time. Uh, but there's a lot of office kits out there. Next up is the tablet, uh, optimized for frontline users with uh, a little less training than maybe their, their lab-based counterparts. Um, they're focused on forensics and uh, it's designed to be easily utilized with a touchscreen interface. This is the lightest, most portable and, and arguably one of the easiest solutions to use on the market. Um, we, we enable an XRY workflow. Uh, to ensure that followers uh, that users follow an organizational policy. So more on workflows for frontline users in a moment. There's a built-in camera for image capture and supporting evidence to complement digital evidence. Uh, some of the fastest extraction times on the market. Uh, again, we're going to talk about workflows coming up. That's tablet and the kiosk. Optimal solution for a station where it can be used by multiple operators, each within their own login to help uh, with triage and filtering of analysis of mobile devices. It's a de dedicated terminal, uh, designed for ease of use with the workflow, uh, great triage opportunity here, uh, uh, large storage, managed workflow processes, supported by an option for image capture. Um, a blue LED indicator allows for visual notifications of what the unit status is, and again, runs a workflow and we'll talk uh, about workflows here coming up. We get a lot of questions about the kiosk and security. Um, it is a lockdown type of device. So we've made multiple improvements when it comes to system security. And you can see those listed here. Because it's a kiosk, you'll see our interface and users won't be able to bring up windows or make changes to systems. Uh, we removed all those kind of uh, uh, those user error type situations uh, by giving them access to the background, um, but very straightforward and easy to use. Kiosk is all about security. And with that, the kiosk has been evaluated by NIST and the results are available from their website, high marks for security um, uh, using XRY kiosk. Last but not least is the ability to gain a kiosk or tablet-like experience on your own hardware, and that's done using XRY Express. While not technically hardware for our, our presentation today, it is added to your hardware and can be an important option if you already own great hardware. So again, XRY Express, like kiosk and tablet, they contain the same powerful extraction engine of XRY with a simplified user interface called the workflow. You're not getting um, a watered-down product by by using these these uh, hardware options, you're getting the full XRY extraction engine again with a simplified interface. So, so we've mentioned it a few times. The last piece: what's a workflow? Um, what is it, and how it's used to increase your efficiency? A workflow is a simplified interface laid over our software tools to make uh, technology more accessible to more users. Keep in mind that the simplified interface using workflows that I'm going to show you um, are XRY, um, but with, with, with that nice layover, um, I often say uh, it's big buttons for big fists. Maybe those those operators that aren't maybe technically inclined, but this gives them very simplistic views on what's the next step. So these workflows are standard um, that you'll see today, and in some cases, they're customized for a particular deployment or, or desired result, and that's usually based on your department procedures or needs or requirements. So we have our main screen here. Um, I have a mobile device I'd like to extract and I've received a, a minimum amount of training to allow me to get a log on for the kiosk. So let's go through a sample workflow. In this example, the first screen after logging in on a kiosk running a standard workflow gives me several options you see here. We have extract data. We have the ability to view the extractions uh, using a version of examine. We have a SIM cloning feature in case, in case one of my users is, has the ability uh, to do a SIM clone to, to make something operate and then do a SIM extraction and device finder to review information about different devices. Again, these could be tailored to not only with the machine, but it could be tailored to the user's level of experience and even how well they've worked in the past. They're doing well, they're getting it, they're getting successful, successful extractions. You can elevate their abilities and give them options, uh, more options on these screens. But for this purpose, I'm gonna select extract data. The next screen is the information collection screen where I can cho choose who owns the device and some examiner case notes. I can complete those fields and then hit next. 
Uh, we have an on-screen keyboard, or you can place a keyboard in front of the kiosk, entirely up to you. So I'm hitting next. Uh, my SOPs may require some additional information and asks if the camera should be launched to take a picture of a consent form. So this particular case isn't a consent case, so I'm gonna select no. Again, these are customizable steps based on your procedure. So you may not need all of the screens that I'm gonna show you today. I'm gonna click no, skip the form capture. Again, this is customizable. And in this case, the customer required additional screens to explain the process for identifying a device. So I've already pulled out the correct cable. I'm hitting next. And with the recent version uh, upgrade of our workflows, we're now able to add video explanations within the process to highlight important information, especially for lower or less trained users. Um, could be really useful in kind of showing what you should do rather than the, the writing on the screen and, and people pushing through prompts. And then lastly, the, the option to add evidence photos using an external camera. Um, take pictures of the screen, take pictures of what you have in front of you, maybe the back of the device, maybe the screen is broken, you wanna memorialize that. You could also incorporate that as part of the workflow. So that's a basic view of workflows. And I get a lot of questions about workflows and, and, and putting information out to frontline users. Um, I've, used, um, I've used this in the past, what's a workflow all about? Um, I'm asked by examiners about placing those simplified tools in the hands of those users, and they often have some concerns. Um, I use the following analogy. I, I have in this photo an ASC certified mechanic. He's got 14 years of experience um, in high level automotive troubleshooting. He's called upon by management in high profile cases where a customer maybe has found a mechanical de defect or maybe they're being sued. Um, he's high level. Is, is this an efficient way of handling the workload by having this highly trained individual changing tires? And I, I think the answer is no, it's not efficient. We, we could train people with less training um, and maybe less abilities in this particular field to conduct these simpler um, examinations and simpler needs um, for the greater result and for the, for the greater good. So on to our final subject, and it's time to build an ecosystem using the information you've been given uh, during this very lengthy webinar thus far. So this is a beginner's guide to an ecosystem approach, efficiency, and our deployment model. So I'm a hands-on type person and I learned things best when I could do it myself. And often that results in some breakage. Uh, I, I, I will give you that, but I'll do all the clicking as we move through our building our ecosystem so there's no breakage. Uh, we're going to build an ecosystem for our hypothetical mid-sized agency that has offices spread across a geographical footprint. Uh, we have about 10 slides to go over here to show you how this operates, so stay with me here. All right, so we already have a server set up where evidence files are kept. Um, those files are produced by the four trained examiners in our tech unit currently, and they are also road testing an MSAB kiosk. They've read the NIST testing report about the kiosk and seem pretty impressed with the security features. Some of them secretly like the blue LED light that indicates functions on the kiosk, but they haven't shared that uh, publicly with their counterparts yet. Um, as the examiners start increasing the number of examinations completed, the intelligent unit is set up with four full versions of examine running on their, ne on their network computers. They have access to the shared drive where the tech unit in forensics lab is producing and placing those files. Um, XRY files are kept because are kept there because these files are a secure container file and can't be tampered with. So they can open up XRY files and review that data as needed without fear of, of changing that data, which is great. Um, the next step is the green light for exec director installation was given by our network gurus. Uh, they've also read the literature and the NIST reviews. Uh, they were given details about XRY files and how because they're secure containers, the network is under no threat by that, that information being passed across their, their very secure network. They're also quite pleased that the drivers uh, that XRY uses are Microsoft certified. XRI director um, is installed on the server and an exec director terminal you see is, uh, is also set up for the review and reporting uh, purposes related to exec director. So the next step in our ecosystem rollout is the narcotics unit has been doing their own exams for some time. They decide that their current tool is too expensive for renewals and isn't getting into as many phones as they hoped. 
So an XRY office license and cable kit is given to them. They're connected to the network when at their desk and uploads of their XRY files are also being completed. They're extracting three phones at a time with one XRY license and their productivity has clearly increased. XRY Photon is also a fan favorite in the narcotics unit and they're extracting WhatsApp data daily, uh, data that was unavailable for, for them um, prior to their installation of XRY. It's been high fives all around down at the narcotics unit and their beards have never looked so groomed with the extra time they have. All right, our next step, after a brief training and review session with the major crimes unit and the special victims unit, they are also given a kiosk, a kiosk and tablet respectively. So how are they using it? Witnesses who were hesitant to provide evidence from their mobile de devices for fear of losing their phone for a day are now a little bit more cooperative as they watch the examina examination of the device being done during the interviews while in these units. So they're seeing an increase in the number of phones they're extracting, the data they have available, and evidence to prove their cases as well, um, and they, they seem pretty happy with that step. And then the last kind of piece of the puzzle or second to last piece of the puzzle is that exec in export is going to be installed to transport and convert XRY files into extended XML files. Uh, the intelligence unit is really pleased because the data is automatically ingested into their Penlink PLX system, and that's their primary analysis tool for the agency. So that information is automatically being dropped in Penlink. And last but not least, local police officers are now asking about the kiosk and tablets they're seeing being used and requesting access to run phones in patrol when needed. A kiosk is added to a locked vestibule to give them access and is running a custom simplified workflow tailored to patrol work and their needs um, as, as they move forward and, and tailored as they move forward. So I have a few operational questions that you may also have. And again, we'll have some Q&A at the end here. What benefits are we seeing in this deployment that we just talked about for our department? And maybe it wasn't all at once, maybe it was over time. Uh, all at once is great too, um, but, but the realization of, of the benefits over time is, is something to track. So the first benefit is automatic backup of encrypted files, backups. Um, I cannot tell you how many places that I've been and, and even in my former uh, unit when I took over that backups of files was always an issue. Using an exec setup, you can create an easy way to back up all of your evidence files. So two years later, when you need to pull those, review those, provide them to defense again, because they've lost them, uh, you have those backup, uh, backups available to you. Uh, the tech unit backlog has been reduced through the distribution of basic examinations to the field. Again, back to that advanced mechanic working on the simple ones, or do you provide that ability to the local front end, frontline user? Uh, the major crimes unit and the special victims unit people conducting their own simplified logical exams or even taking screenshots off of a device on their own, not having to call uh, a higher trained or better trained forensic examiner to come to their location. Um, you also don't have to pull the phone for, for a couple of days as you wait. So an increase in productivity there. Difficult examinations are still forwarded to the lab as always. The lab examiners, because of the reduction in incoming work, because simplified exams are being done on the periphery, they're free to hone their skills for more difficult cases. So they become more advanced users and more advanced forensic examiners. So when the hard ones come through, um, nobody's scrambling. They're able to, to get those cases done. Opportunities to gather valuable evidence are not lost at the field units. Again, time sensitivity is often the issue. That's the feedback we're getting. Uh, that's the feedback we're getting about the interest in kiosks and tablets on scene or out at a scene as well. So those are available to you. Usage is uniform throughout the agency and, and written into SOP and, and it's so uniform across the agency that now users can ex assist other users. The less I have to call the forensic lab guys or girls and ask them questions, about simplistic issues that I'm having, and other people have run into those issues that were covered in training, but I haven't done it in a while. Users helping users is a more efficient way to get things done. And ultimately, if it's if it's a, a problem that can't be solved, those those high level examiners are still available. 
The intelligence unit is reporting an influx of usable information that is resulting in actual actionable intelligence. So there's been a problem where forensic exams have been done historically by agencies and that data resides on a DVD and a case file somewhere never to be seen or used again, never to be used towards the recognition of a larger, maybe criminal element, maybe an ongoing trend. Um, so, so with an intelligence unit, seeing that actionable intelligence increase, overall crime is reduced and, and, and more suspects are identified. And this is on the management level. So weekly exec director reports sent to management have identified some users who are less successful. This comes down to our reporting aspect that I really did not get uh, uh, into today. Um, but we have customizable reports that could be sent automatically um, that will identify if a user has not been as successful as others. So if uh, most users are have an 80% uh, success rate and you have one or two users that have a 20 or 30% success rate, very simply do a training refresh. And, and you would not have identified that problem necessarily without that management report and that, that connected way of looking at things. So based on user feedback, a separate workflow has been created for the special victims unit. They're not needing some of the usability that major crimes is needing. They want it to be faster. They are doing it during interviews or while a, a witness or, or victim is still within the building. They wanna take a few steps out because it's just unnecessary things it, within the workflow. So we make that modification for them. And, and that's, that's doable. And management has placed budgetary requests earlier because when we were placing our budgetary requests, we could see when licenses expire. So keeping track of licenses that renew at different stages during the year for a bunch of outlying offices um, has been a problem for some agencies in the past. Um, being able to bring up one screen and see when a license expires and be able to, to anticipate that and, and create budgetary requests early on uh, makes things a lot easier and a lot more efficient. So examinations have been more successful because all systems are updated with the latest software using exec director. I mentioned this earlier. If you're using a dated version of a tool, a lot has probably been uh, done by our research and development team to add more devices, more workarounds, more exploits, more passcode bypasses, uh, checkmate usability. All those things have been baked in over the last few months. Um, if you're using an old version, you're not getting those benefits. So keeping things up to date, examinations become more successful, more evidence collected, more success in the courtroom because of more evidence. All right, so. I, I've kind of outlaid a, a sample or, or hypothetical implementation here among our, our small uh, widespread agency and, and talked about results. Um, but with installations in the field, we have other, other customers who are also seeing some of those, those real benefits. So the Tennessee Department of Corrections, for example, they deployed eight kiosks and cameras at their facilities. The extractions are done on the spot. Formerly, they were sent to a centrally located uh, location. So obviously the backlog begins, get in line, that type of thing. So they put in place a standard set of tools for all involved. They extended their capabilities um, using tablets out to their probation and patrol, uh, parole officers, meaning knock on a door, check on a parolee, confirm that they're not doing anything they're not supposed to be doing, download a phone to confirm they're not having communications or, or going places on the web they shouldn't be. Um, uh, very useful to their probation and patrol officer, uh, parole officers, excuse me. Uh, they invested in proper training. I can't stress that enough. Putting tools in the field is one thing. Uh, an appropriate amount of training is a whole other. Um, efficiency is going to be realized through proper training and proper equipment together. So they invested in proper training. They trained their examiners. They trained their parole and probation people on what to do and how to do it. In 2016, they only did 79 phones uh, within this agency. Less than a year later, they saw a 746% increase in the number of phones they extracted. As more information gets to those outlying units, more people become aware of what's available and what's possible, and you will see those increases. And because you're building efficiency in, like the Tennessee Department of Corrections did, you're prepared. They reduced gang activities and increased drug interceptions as well. Now they're monitoring communications by pulling the, the phone information. They're getting ahead of things before drugs maybe were set up to come into the prison and are getting ahead of those drops before they happen and preventing them. Um, again, it's all about efficiency. It's all about uh, making the job smoother, 
making the information more uh, easy to access and, and ultimately putting more bad guys, even the ones in jail, um, uh, on their heels. Another example is the UK counterterrorism uh, uh, group. This is a cost analysis, strictly a cost analysis. Um, it's also about error analysis as well. So they did analysis before and after networked kiosks were installed. You could see that transport by hand to a local lab was costing them an extended amount of money. Um, turnaround time was uh, pretty long, five to six weeks. They reduced that to giving it into the hands of local users, reducing to that turnaround time to two to three hours to get something done. Um, they were concerned about the risk of data corruption. Uh, they created a, a connected system like we've been talking about today, uh, an encrypted con uh, connectivity system. Errors were 20%. Uh, their error rate was 20% amongst basic users, and that dropped to less than 4% after a year and less than 1% after the second year. Uh, basic users were often reluctant to attempt downloads, uh, resulted in further loss of confidence and less intelligence ultimately available. By training them properly and giving them simplified tools, huge increase in the confidence level, and ultimately more work gets done. So this is just another example of, of an ecosystem deployment that was successful and, and gives you the ability for accountability. So the MSAB ecosystem, ecosystem in a word, it just empowers success on all levels of the organization. That's the goal. Um, that's the ultimate goal to, to, to get there for an ecosystem. It's, it's a, a, a often an organization-wide deployment. We have people in place to assist you to get that done. And we would like to see, it, see that success. So I've covered a ton of information here. I'm going to open it up to some question and answer about tools, hardware, the ecosystem in general. Uh, be glad to, to attempt to answer those questions for you. Let me open up my control panel. Uh, are these slides available for download? Yeah, we can make these slides available for download so you can review at a later time. Sure, we can. Any other questions? If you have questions, you can place them in the uh, the question box uh, that's part of the interface for, for GoToWebinar. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Please quickly review the extraction capability of BFU and AFU. Uh, for those of you not familiar with a BFU and an AFU extraction are, uh, this is a reference to extractions from iOS devices, Apple devices, and the use of uh, an exploit that came out last year called Checkmate. So Checkmate gives the ability to extract more data um, and circumvent some of the security on an iOS device. Uh, so BFU is the process by which um, a phone has been power cycled, but has never been unlocked by the user. That's the most limited data that you can get, but prior to Checkmate exploit, you couldn't get anything, you just couldn't get in. So a BFU exploit will often give you information um, Related to account data, we've seen photos, we've seen uh, email address information outside the, the uh, secure area. So a BFU, meaning it hasn't been unlocked by the user, but we're still using the exploit, gets you minimal information. Um, but I often talk to law enforcement um, and especially detectives that are interested in just identifying who owns the phone. Those account details in a, just a BFU extraction may very well give you that information. The process is in line. You start an XRY extraction. You'll see that extraction progress. If uh, XRY recognizes the phone as one that falls under the Checkmate exploit, you'll be given a set of screens and how to employ that exploit. Once you do, um, you'll see it begin that, that exploited information. Um, AFU is kind of the next level up. That is a phone that has been power cycled, but the user has locked it after a power cycle. I'm sorry, unlocked it after a power cycle. Once it's unlocked once, that kind of opens up a lot more folders and areas for the examiner. 
Um, an AFU exploit, just like a BFU exploit, will be in line in the steps that you use during XRY. Um, and it's the same process for, for placing the phone in DFU mode. You're just going to get a lot more data in an AFU. Um, and then once the power recycles on that phone after the extraction is complete using the exploit, um, that exploit is removed and that phone is back to basics. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Oh, okay. I see a couple more now. Let me run through these real quick. Uh, the question is, if you want to extract metadata from the phone, you can just extract data straight away, or would you need to do a SIM cloning and then extract the data so the data won't change? I'm not quite sure exactly what you mean, but if uh, if my impression's wrong, please re-ask the question. But if you want to extract metadata from the phone, um, that's, that's customarily included in a, an extraction. If you're talking about pulling SIM card information, or it's a phone that requires the SIM to be in the phone to run, but you want to do an extraction on the SIM card, you would remove that SIM card when the phone's powered off. You'd copy that SIM card using a, a tool with an XRY. Uh, you'd use the copied SIM to place in the device and then do the extraction of the device using that, that clone SIM card and do a separate extraction on that SIM, that original evidence. I hope that answers your question. Um, unrelated, but how is training handled now? We have options for in-person training. Um, we have options for training just for your agency or open training, which is you sign up and there may be other agencies there. Uh, we also have the option for online training, and you can review those options on our website uh, under the training tab. We're, we're pushing those those new courses out. Our training department has been really responsive in getting those courses um, and certifications online. So, so you could do that either online um, live or online in due course and, and receive your certificate. So feel free to look at msab.com and check under the training tab for uh, up, upcoming classes. Uh, hi, we are unable to get data from dual space WhatsApp. I imagine you mean that there's two separate instances of WhatsApp. Um, uh, XRY now supports uh, dual instances of the same app uh, on the device. So running that in the latest version of XRY will assist you in getting it from both sides. Um, iOS and Android unlocking capability of XRY. Uh, that's a pretty big one. That's a pretty big one. Um, we have several webinars that kind of address that as well. I will give you the short answer uh, to Rohit. The short answer is that there are capabilities that you will that will reveal themselves in line when you begin an exam. Uh, iOS unlocking capa capability is is both um, checkmate exploit and brute force in some cases. Android unlocking capability, uh, there are plenty of passcode bypasses uh, already with an XRY in very up-to-date phones and, and, and operating system versions. So uh, yeah, it, with, with specifics maybe offline, if you email me, we'll get you in touch with somebody to discuss your specific needs and, and kind of address what you're seeing as far as handsets. Is there any rule to choose which exploit to be run? Uh, yeah, so you'll you'll get inline options when you start your examination. Those inline options will let you know that something is available to you and that maybe there's a, by, a bypass available to you. Uh, we log everything we do in a very extensive and plain language log that we keep in all the XRY files. So uh, the answer is yes, there, there will be uh, the ability to choose certain exploits as they come up during your examination. Um, I'm trying to refer back to somebody's original question. I'm thinking the question is the ability to make an evidence quality image of the data with CRC certainly certainty. So, uh, Tim, just to answer your question, you're making an evidence quality um, extraction of of the of the device. Uh, mobile forensics works really different than uh, the customary computer forensics as far as the concept of imaging. Um, you extract the device, you log it, you're able to reconstitute uh, exactly what was done 
um, using that log. It's very specific. We hash uh, all the files that we extract and we actually hash the extraction. Um, so tampering isn't something that, that is of concern because if that hash is changed, that file is unusable and unopenable in XRY. Um, and, and that's certainly towards the, maybe your, your question is coming from a uh, arguing away the security of the file. It'll definitely keep you uh, on the stand answering questions about file security um, a lot for a lot less time. Um, who would use an XRY camera in an ecosystem? Um, so if you have an ecosystem, those cameras could be attached to the local kiosks or tablets. Um, if for some reason you want to memorialize evidence, uh, I, you often use the cracked screen. You want to show that the, there was a cracked screen on the device when you recut, when you when you uh, pulled it from the suspect, so that you're not accused of breaking it. Uh, you want to show a, a broken micro USB port, and that's why maybe you did a, a Bluetooth extraction, that type of thing. Um, that's why a camera may be added uh, to the individual platforms connected to an ecosystem. Those photos will be added as an XRY file as part of your case file. So if uh, the question is about where those go, those would be part of your case and also could be uploaded to a main server um, and backed up and, and viewed. Uh, thanks. You're, you're welcome. You're very welcome. Um, I'm going to put up my, my contact info here in a second. So if you have follow-up questions uh, via email is probably the best way. And, and we'll we'll kind of parse out those email questions and, and specific concerns uh, to the appropriate support people within uh, MSAB. I'll, I, again, I want to thank Duncan Marchbank from our support team for being online today uh, and helping out with some of the questions and, and being available. Uh, and he very well might be somebody that may be answering some of your questions as well. So uh, I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, again, I told you I'd put my contact info up here. Thanks for attending the ecosystem of mobile forensics. I hope this was helpful. If anything, I hope it gave you a very broad based view of what's possible um, in order to ask informed questions and find out what would be suitable for your agency. Um, and, and there's my information. Again, uh, email is probably the best way uh, to kind of parse through some of these questions and I'll be glad to get back to you all uh, with those questions. All right, you're very welcome. And uh, thank you everyone. Have a great day. Uh, we'll probably make this webinar available to you to re-watch from our website. Um, and as well, if, the, if you have an interest in the, the particular PowerPoint for some further details, uh, I'll be glad to share some slides with you. Thanks for attending and uh, have a great day.